and welcome. My name is Emma Rennie and I am the BB Beyond Project Coordinator at the Brussels Finder and I will be briefly opening today's event. This event is part of the Women's Leadership Dialogue series, which was organized to mark the end of the EU funded Brussels Binder Beyond project. As consortium partners, the Brussels Binder, Bruegel and the German Marshall Fund of the United States endeavored over the past two years to raise awareness on the need for greater gender inclusivity in policy and media discussions. They did this by fostering a solution focused environment where members of the pan-European BB Beyond Network could come together to share experiences and develop tools for innovative and inclusive convening. However, it was just over a year ago when COVID-19 had reached European shores, and although the pandemic had far-reaching implications for all sections of society, women in particular have been negatively impacted in more ways than one, including their participation in policy making and shaping to the, in response to the crisis. As the European Union moves forward with its recovery plan, questions have been raised on how gender responsive the plan is and whether it is effective enough to not only halt the widening gender gap, but can it actually make progress to close it? So it is my great pleasure to introduce Naomi O'Leary, who is the Europe correspondent at the Irish Times and who will be moderating today's panel discussion. Naomi also co-hosts the acclaimed Irish Passport podcast on Irish culture, history and politics. Her previous positions include working as correspondent for political routers amongst other media outlets across Europe. So thank you for joining us, Naomi, and I will pass the floor on to you. Thanks so much, Emma, and welcome to everybody who's following this great event on this really prescient topic of women, COVID-19 and the EU recovery plan. Um, so I work for the Irish Times and I'm delighted to introduce a great panel of speakers uh, that are here with us today to, to discuss these issues. If at any point you have a question um, as we move on to the discussion part, don't hesitate to put it in the Q&A, which you'll find down at the bottom right of your screen on Zoom. So to introduce our speakers, we have Ms. Mary, Mary Collins, who's an expert in economic and social policies. She's a senior policy and advocacy coordinator with the European Women's Lobby. Prior to that, she worked in child protection for the Health Authority in Ireland and for the European Federation of Organizations working with the homeless in Brussels. For the past 15 years, Mary has worked on issues including violence against women, EU asylum and human rights policies, the EU strategy on the rights of the child and the UN Convention on Disabled Persons. We also have Dr. Maria de Mertzis, who is Deputy Director at Bruegel. She's previously worked at the European Commission and the Research Department of the Dutch Central Bank. She's held academic positions at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in the USA and the University of Strathclyde in the UK, from which she holds a PhD in economics. She's also published extensively in international academic journals and contributed regular policy inputs to both the European Commission and the Euro Dutch Central Bank's policy outlets. We're also delighted to have with us today the Honourable Alexandra Geza, an MEP from Germany, who has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019. She's responsible for the Digital Services Act on behalf of the Greens Parliamentary Group. She's also a member of the Budget Committee, where she advocates for gender equality in budgeting, as well as being a member of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee and coordinator for the Greens Parliamentary Group in the Artificial Intelligence Special Committee. Also delighted to be joined by Doc, Mr. Dan Mobley, who's appointed Corporate Directions Direct, Relations Director of Diageo in June 2017. Prior to that, he served as Corporate Relations Director for Europe, and he has also worked at Standard Charters in various roles, including Regional Head of Corporate Affairs for India, South Asia, Africa, and Group Head of Government Relations. He's got extensive experience um, in government, including in Her Majesty's Treasury and Foreign Co and Commonwealth Office, where he worked as a diplomat in Brussels in the UK rep. Last but not least, we have Dr. Jakob Kierkegaard, who is a non-resident senior fellow with the Peterson Institute for International Economics, which is a Washington DC based macroeconomic think tank where he's worked since 2002. His current research focuses on labor markets, European economies and structural inst and institutional reform, as well as transatlantic relations among other issues. Um, so thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us. And just a reminder that you can put questions in the chat in the Q&A function on the bottom right. 
So first of all, we're going to hear from Miss Mary Collins. Each speaker will have three to four minutes uh, to make a few remarks just to kick off the discussion. And um, if uh, just keep time so that we do have time for audience Q&A questions, I will jump in if uh, you're running over too much uh, so that we can get uh, to those questions. So please, Miss Mary Collins, thanks very much for starting us off. Well, good morning or good evening or afternoon, everybody. And um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And I also want to congratulate you on organizing this event. I think it's very timely as we kind of take a little pause a year on what has been, I would qualify as a kind of a topsy-turvy year. And also it's a moment of truth to see where we're at. So just first of all, to remind ourselves that the pandemic was a wake up call was a wake up call on the essential role that women play in society. They are the backbone of society and without whom society would have simply collapsed. They held up, propelled our health, care, education, sanitary systems and maintained our food supplies as well. It also gave a lot of visibility to how women were taken, are taken for granted and they're undervalued, underpaid, in precarious working conditions. And it gave exposure as well to the overrepresentation of migrant and minority women in the care sector and in low paid jobs. So one year on, where are we at? What we have seen is that women's disproportionate unpaid care work increased substantially. And while not all women were able to telework, telework did become the norm for both women and men but women's share of unpaid care work increased. And we can see, for example, in countries such as Belgium, where there were specific COVID-19 um, parental leave measures aimed at both women and men on a part-time basis, that actually at the end of the day, it was more women who took up that form of leave than men. What we also saw was uh, male violence against women increased dramatically in every single country throughout the world. And so much so that the UN Secretary General called it a shadow pandemic. And at the same time, what we saw was some countries, uh, notably Turkey, but other countries within the EU as well, are challenging the Istanbul Convention, which is the most uh, forward looking convention on addressing violence against women. So what have we learned really? We've learned that it doesn't really take very much to revert to rigid gender stereotypes on roles and expectations. And I should say that we were warned about this 75 years ago by Simone de Beauvoir, but it uh, has actually emerged. So looking forward, what we see is a bleak situation. We see that the sectors of the economy where women work are more prone to unemployment, impacting particularly on young women, migrant women, and women with low educational attainment. And there are reports that are showing that a lot of some women are dropping out of the labor market completely. So this is very, very worrying for the future. So I think we can officially declare that there's a C session and women should not and cannot and should not pay the price of COVID. It's not about fixing women into a patriarchal system that is broken, but it's about an opportunity to fix the system for the benefit of all. It's an opportunity to move towards a more greener, more inclusive, equal economy, and that care should be at the center of that. So what have we got on the table now? We have a green deal, we have a digital deal, although it's not framed as such, and what's missing from that equation is a care deal. The pandemic has shown us more than ever before how interdependent we are on each other. And that care has to be an essential part of our lives, caring for the planet, caring for each other. And we need a life cycle approach to care, not just about childcare, but that actually takes care, takes the issues of care throughout the whole life cycle. So I just want to also um, refer to the Court of Auditors report, which was published last week on uh, gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. And I think the title speaks for itself. It says the title is time to turn words into action. We know that budgets mirror political priorities and we now have an opportunity in the recovery and resilience facility to actually address these issues. 
So what we are asking our members to do in the European Women's Lobby is to analyze their national recovery and resilience plans, which governments are now submitting to the European Commission. And on the basis of the evidence that we will gather, if we feel that there isn't enough or a strong gender mainstreaming approach in these um, plans, we will be calling on the Commission to either revise or to reject the plans. So we're in the process of doing that. But I can just say now for the moment, um, the information, the feedback we're getting is that there are descriptive um, analysis about the situation of women and men in different countries, but they're actually very limited targeted investments. We cannot let another decade pass and we need to all combine our forces to make that this to ensure that the transformative change actually happens over time. So I leave it like that for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mary. And the next speaker that we're going to hear from now is Dr. Mar Maria de Mertzitz. If you'd like to pick up now, um, de Maria de Mertzitz, to remind you, is Deputy Director at Bruegel. Uh, thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, thank you very much all for organizing this. Uh, um, and, and let me just start by, by saying that now we've come into the, the end of the three-year cycle, how delighted uh, we have been at, at Bruegel to, uh, to co-host this together with the German Marshall Fund, uh, the, the initiative on the, uh, on the BB and beyond. Uh, this has been extremely uh, important, and I speak also as a woman economist here, not, also, not only as a, as a professional, how important it has been to raise awareness of this. And dare I say, even uh, in places like in, at Bruegel, this has made an, an incredible difference in the way that we we approach the issue of, of, uh, of gender in, in all the activities that we have, from choosing speakers, where the database, of course, is very important, all the way to ensuring that we have the right data uh, on, on gender uh, issues that is going to allow us to define policy. So with that, uh, uh, just a reflection on how important this, this initiative has been and how delighted we have been at Bruegel uh, to co-host it and co-lead it. So if I may go uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the question at hand today on, on, on where we stand uh, after the uh, pandemic, or rather I should say during the pandemic, because we are not, we're not at the end of it, um, and what we've learned. Um, I, I wanted to take a step back in my introductory remarks and, and, and say a few things about how we came into the pandemic, where were we on these issues when we came to the pandemic, and hopefully in the discussions I can, I can come back and also offer some data and complement some of the things that Mary said, uh, and also discuss what we can do as, as we move forward. Um, and, and the reason why I want to do that is because I have done a little bit of research on, on, on some issues which I would like to raise here, which I think are crucial inputs to the discussion of, of what, uh, uh, what this means for uh, gender equality and also for uh, gender participation. Um, when we started, when the pandemic started in, in, in March of last year, the, the first question we asked uh, uh, was how prepared are we to meet this? And, and the one question that, uh, that we ask is whether we were financially fragile. What, what this means is effectively whether households, and I'll come to the women in, in a minute, are, are financially prepared to meet with a very big shock that lay ahead of them, which is basically no work. We were very worried that uh, the shutdowns were going to lead to huge uh, unemployment at the time. Uh, likely the, the, the news there is actually not so bad in Europe. Uh, but that was the fear was that we're going to have surges of unemployment waves uh, that were going to have, of course, an important and huge burden on, on the households. So then we asked the question, are we prepared to meet this? Do we have sufficient buffers uh, in, our, uh, in our portfolios to be able to meet uh, uh, whatever the shutdown at the, the, the time was going to be? Um, there is data on this at the European Union, and then the, 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 unfortunately the news isn't very good. Coming into the pandemic, one on three households were reporting, self-reporting, that they considered themselves to be financially fragile. So they were incapable of meeting an unexpected expense uh, of the order of magnitude. It varies from country to country, but of the order of magnitude of, let's say, fixing uh, a car that has broken or buying new appliance for the house, or maybe an unexpected uh, operation, uh, opera costs for an operation or, an, or a funeral. These are not daily costs, but there are types of costs uh, that all of us uh, will have to incur at some point 
point. And one in three households in the EU were saying that they were incapable of meeting that. Um, we felt this was actually rather unsatisfactory in the sense that, you know, Europe is one of the richest continents in the world, and yet one in three households is unable to meet that uh, where to arise. Now, it is important to reflect also the fact that we didn't ask any questions about wealth. A lot of people in the EU have got houses, but it would not be sensible to sell a house to meet an unexpected expense, like buying a new washing machine or something like that. So there is, of course, wealth in households. But when it comes to cash uh, that we all need to meet our expenses, uh, households did not fare very well. An important thing to raise here is that um, there are very big differences in the EU. So when we talk about EU, it's important not to masquerade that there are really big differences uh, between countries. Let me bring that closer to women here. And if you take the same question and, and ask um, single parent households, so pa pa households where you have single parent and children, this number jumps from one in three all the way to more than one in two. Uh, so one in two single parent households in, in the EU uh, are self-reported to be financially fragile. This isn't very good news. And the reason why this is important for the conversation we're having now is that we know that the vast majority of these single parent households are really led by a mother. Uh, so this is really affecting women in ways that are really disproportionate. And again, the, um, there are big differences in countries. And here I'd like to name a few countries like the UK and Ireland. Uh, the single uh, parent households that self-report to be financially fragile are more than 70%. And this is really something that requires uh, treatment with some urgency. And then what do you do about this? And, and of course, education always comes into mind when we think about this. How, how do we educate people to prepare financial for financial uh, shocks that may arise? You can never prepare for a pandemic type of shock, uh, but how do you make sure? And this is, remember, these numbers were numbers that were addressed before the pandemic. We think for ourselves a peaceful period uh, to think about one in three households in the EU being financially fragile it really is uh, quite excessive. Um, and you know, education, financial literacy, these are the types of things where we know women lag behind and we know that this can make a difference in terms of, of, uh, sort of leveling the playing field, removing some of the imbalances that, that comes to uh, the fragility of, of, uh, uh, of, of women. Um, the, the numbers on financial literacy are again also disappointing. We know that there's a, le a lot less women that are financially literate understand the risks, prepare for risks of the future, prepare for um, uh, old age in terms of building up pension, uh, pension uh, uh, assets. These are types of things that can help women, uh, households and, their, and the society, as, as Mary said, uh, to be better prepared for the crisis if, or for any crisis that might arise. Let me stop here and I'll come in the conversation, I'll bring it back to where we are today and what we can do for the future. That's a great point to come in on um, with perhaps MEP Alexander Geza, if you'd like to pick up there. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I would like to, um, to speak a little bit about how this went in the European Parliament and in terms of the regulation and Next Generation EU, which is the big um, package of the European Union to support the European econom economy and to modernize it. I think it was already clear in May 2020 that women were particularly affected by this crisis. And Mary Collins has already explained part of the reasons. There's a second reason that is very important and has been quite annoyed that women usually work in the client facing sectors. And those were the sectors that are particularly hit by the crisis. It's not the industry, it's not the automotive industry. It's really where you work with people and that's where women are employed. And I thought this was totally obvious. So I was absolutely convinced that next generation EU would take that into account. And when the first proposal came by the commission for the regulation of the recovery and resilience fund, which is the heart piece basically of next generation EU with 750 billion, um, women were not even mentioned. This dimension was simply not taken into account at all. And therefore, I started a battle um, with support by the European Europeans Women Lobby. We started a petition called Half of It that called for um, giving half of the funds on the next generation EU to women, which is a very general claim, but we had very specific asks how this could work. And we uh, built up a network in Parliament among members of Parliament in order to support this claim. And we managed to come up with a really revolutionary position of the European Parliament on this regulation, which said that 
the recovery and resilience plans, which member states have to, uh, to table with the European Commission in order to touch those funds, must be based on a gender impact assessment of the planned measures and shall comprise key actions to effectively address the negative impact of the crisis on gender equality. And this would really have made the difference, not only for women, but also for sustainable growth. Because we know that without women, there will not be growth, in, especially in the countries that are hardest hit. For example, Italy, which is also the country with which 200 billions uh, gets the lion's share of this package. And in Italy, the, the, um, the rate of female employment dropped from 52%, which is already very low, to 48%. Um, and this has been, unfortunately, this great position of the European Parliament was completely killed in trilogue. So council um, was definitely opposed to this. And from what I hear, um, commission supported council and not parliament in this battle. And I think this is, this is very, very unfortunate. So what we ended up with um, were some provision in the guidelines that the task force recover, which within the commission is responsible for assessing those national recovery and resilience plans. Um, because I, I and a few colleagues intervened with experts from all over Europe to make sure at least in the guidelines something was included. And therefore we have um, the provision that plans have to explain how women are hit by the crisis and how this is going to be tackled. But unfortunately, this is not mandatory. And I think the, the commission, especially the task force recover has done a great job working with member states while they were preparing the plans. But since this is not a mandatory priority, it's, um, it's up to the member states to decide how many funds they want to destine to women. Now, uh, Next Generation EU, or the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, gives 37% to the green transition and 20% to the digital transition. That for a green politician as me working on digital matters sounds really like a great opportunity. The problem is that in these four sectors, it's digital and then um, we have transport buildings basically um, and what's the third and uh, renew renewable energies. The share of women being employed in those companies is below 20%. So we are giving more or less 60% of the European money for the recovery to four industrial sectors in which very, very few women work. So this is going to worsen the gender employment gap, definitely. And this is not being addressed. And this is what we are seeing in the national plans. Although the guidelines say there have to be provisions in order to address gender equality also in the green and in the digital um, sectors from our first analysis, obviously we haven't had the possibility to read 27 plans. And I appreciate that, that also the European Women's Lobby is working on it, but the plans I have consulted, um, like German and the Italian ones, have extremely, extremely few provisions. And I think this is extremely worrying. On the other hand, to end just on a positive note, um, what happened within this battle is that we managed to have gender budgeting in the MFF, so the long-term uh, budgetary plan of the European Union. And that's very positive because they have to start with developing a methodology for tracking expenses with gender disaggregated data, first for the funds under direct management, and then at a later phase, it's, it should be rolled out for the funds under shared management. And I think this is going to be a revolutionary development. If this, this really works, so I'm following this very closely. I think this is very important work. I have the impression that the commission is taking this very seriously and I'm very much looking forward to following up on this. But I think we also have to follow up on the recovery and resilience plans, see how it goes. This sort of, I mean, the milk is spilled. It's a little bit too late to really intervene, but I think we have to follow what's happening in terms of growth, in terms of women's employment, because the fact that the digital and the green sector will be the sector which will have significant growth and where women are not represented will have devastating consequences, not only for women and gender equality, but also for society as a whole, but because we all know that societies in which women are more represented, be it at company level, be it at the decision maker level, are more sustainable, more resilient and more productive. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Some really interesting points there in terms of gender disparity in industrial sectors and the effect that subsidies could have or stimulus could have on worsening gender divides there from MEP Alexandra Geza. And that's a um, good moment for Mr. Dan Mowgli to come in, who of course is Corporate Relations Director of Diageo and perhaps can offer some further insights from a business point of view in terms of policy in the workplace. Thank you, Naomi, and uh, and great to be here. And big thanks to, to the Brussels Binder, who we're, we're delighted to support. I've, I've had two stints in Brussels in my career, um, one 20 years ago in, in diplomacy and more recently five years ago um, in the private sector in Diageo. And in both occasions, it was clear that there was just not enough space for these kind of topics to be discussed and debated. And although progress had made, we've not made nearly enough progress and the fact I think that's really interesting to me on this topic around COVID and its impact on, on, on gender equality um, is that we're actually still having to make the case to make the awareness raising that this is even a problem. You know, it's starting to filter through media commentary, policymakers are paying attention to it, but the fact that we're simply having to say that we need gender focused budgeting, for instance, or gender focused policymaking is, is quite shocking. It should be a no-brainer that we're in this space, and yet we're still having to, to make the case. So it's great to have fora like this where we can we can actually come together and, and learn from each other on what needs to be done. And I hope it can inject some urgency into tackling it because I do not see the urgency in the policy making and the policy debates uh, today, even though some good work is happening. Uh, and I can certainly see it within the industries that my business as a leading drinks company. Um, is most closely related to in terms of hospitality, tourism and retail, the lifeblood of our industry. Um, we see disproportionate impact on the workforce and the female workforce in those industries. Those are industries that on one hand provide often flexible patterns of working or are more amenable to part-time working, um, uh, have easier entry uh, and can uh, allow people to factor childcare around them but can also be ones where work is lower paid and precarious uh, and less protected. Uh, and although this picture is still emerging as we're still very much in the pandemic in many places around the world, um, it's very clear talking to some of the partners we work with that women are being disproportionately impacted in terms of employment uh, uh, and, uh, and income losses, as well as the lived experience we all have where we can see uh, in our home lives, uh, the disproportionate impact on care, for instance, that Mary spoke very, very eloquently about. And I think ultimately, why is this not being fixed quickly enough? Why are people not paying sufficient attention? I would say it's ultimately because most of our institutions in society are not sufficiently inclusive and diverse, don't have sufficient gender representation in their leadership. Uh, and if uh, women are not sufficiently uh, represented in leadership cadres, then it's not going to translate into better policy making in this space. And so I look at Diageo and how we're trying to tackle this problem. That's the first place where we have started and we've been working on this for a long time. But more than a decade ago, we didn't have any women in our leadership. Our executive team, our board was entirely male. If we look today, 60% um, of our board is female. 40% um, of our executive management team, the top 15 who run the company are female. Uh, and critically, we've set a target to reach gender parity. Um, which we'll report on annually year in our leadership. And we'll reach that long before 2030, which is when the target is set to. And we've introduced incentives to make sure we get there. The top 100 senior managers in the company, if we do not show progress each year against the gender parity target in our leadership that we set for ourselves, we will lose some of our long-term incentive plans. So we'll be hit in our pay packet if we don't deliver progress on representation of, of women at the top of the business. Um, the second area beyond representation is around the policies that we have. And I think these apply equally, whether you're in the public or the private sector. Um, you know, there's a long list of things that we can perhaps discuss in the conversation that companies and all employers should be doing. For us, it's things like shared parental leave. Um, we give fully paid six months shared parental leave. And that's been transformative for both women's prospects in the workplace, but also allowing fathers to take proper representation in childcare. We've seen a dramatic increase in the two years since we introduced this policy in the number of fathers taking time off to care for their children. Uh, it's gone up almost four times uh, so on average now, 103 days spent by new fathers uh, taking parental leave. Um, it's issues like flexible working, which I'm sure we'll discuss. We have a strong philosophy in that space and, and clear policies. 
transparency on pay and promotion. We review this very regularly to see if there's any unconscious bias creeping into pay awards and promotions uh, between men and women and indeed other uh, diversity uh, lenses too. Um, employee networks for coaching and mentoring of women and other underrepresented groups are incredibly powerful too. So you have to look across the whole suite of policies to make sure you're having a sensible impact. But we know what these are. There's plenty of research around this. Uh, it shouldn't be hard for companies and other employers to move quickly in this space. And the final area I'd look at is how companies project ourselves into the world. It's not just good enough anymore to get your own house in order in terms of your internal representation and policies. How do we use our buying power as major procurers from our suppliers to change their approach and behavior? And how do we project ourselves as a consumer goods company through our marketing? We've ensured all our marketing is progressive, um, right down to making sure that none of the agencies, marketing agencies we work with are allowed to pitch to us without having a female director bringing work to us. They must all be trained in progressive marketing for trail so that our adverts and other ways in which we touch the consumer are truly representative of the society that we, uh, we serve. Uh, and again, we'll come on to this in the conversation, but in each of these areas, we don't just do this because it's the right thing to do or because there'll be a positive outcome for society if we get this right as companies. And there is a clear competitive advantages for businesses that move in this direction and get better in this space. So we can create a virtuous circle um, by having a better approach to diversity and inclusion in our businesses. So I'm happy to elaborate on any of that in the conversation and, and delighted to be part of this discussion today. Thanks very much for that contribution. And it's quite interesting to see some examples of granular policies, you know, in place in a particular company um, in, in that uh, discussion by uh, Dan Mobley. And now perhaps we can take a bit of a step back and look at a more macroeconomic point of view to round off this discussion before we get to the Q&A um, from Dr. Jakob Kierkegaard. And just a reminder, I can see that some people are already putting questions in the chat. So that's really great to see in the Q&A. And we'll come to some of those as soon as we've, uh, if we've heard Dr. Kierkegaard. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Naomi. It's a pleasure to join uh, this really very timely and very important event. Um, and I, I guess uh, there's one advantage of being also the last speaker because I'm actually, I think, uh, going to, well, I certainly, I think it's very important to recognize, as has already been mentioned, that uh, the sort of immediate burden that has fallen on women during the pandemic itself with regarding to additional, uh, you know, care for other members of the family, whether it's elderly or children, etc., has been, you know, probably difficult to imagine in a pre uh, pre pandemic uh, scenario where we you know we never imagined this uh, you know a situation where schools uh, might suddenly be closed etc uh, so there's no doubt that from that perspective the women have borne the vast majority of the uh, additional burdens immediately associated with the with the pandemic itself uh, but on the other hand uh, uh, i think it's actually some pretty good news, actually, when we look uh, a little bit forward and we take a closer look at the um, unemployment uh, numbers and who has been affected by unemployment, uh, etc. Because if we take, and again, I fully recognize that there are vast differences across individual uh, EU members, but from a sort of regional perspective, uh, the news are actually certainly, uh, if you had asked me before to describe what the likely impact of such a pandemic would have been uh, <clears throat> on men's and women's employment, pretty good. Of course, reflecting the fact that uh, probably one of the defining characteristics of this pandemic has been the absolutely remarkable and unprecedented, both at national and also at European level, uh, focused around labor markets. But basically, if you if you look at uh, uh, European labor markets, uh, you have had a, dis a loss of about 2.7 million jobs from the fourth quarter of of 2019, basically the last data before the pandemic, and until the fourth quarter of 2020, which is the last uh, data we have available. Um, the good news with that is that roughly uh, these this lot job loss is roughly evenly split between people that go into uh, unemployment and people that simply drop out of the labor market. 
if you focus then on the unemployed uh, uh, category, the gender split is actually roughly even. Uh, so in that sense, it's actually not uh, the case that women's unemployment rates have, uh, on the aggregate European level, skyrocketed relative to men's. It has not. Uh, in fact, it's roughly the same. But even more importantly, when we think about the long-term effect of this um, recession, is if you look at the share of the of Europeans that fell out of the labor market, those that simply dropped out of the labor force entirely. If you look at that number, which is about 1.3 million uh, over that uh, one year period, uh, you will actually see that the vast majority of that category is actually men dropping out of the labor force. Uh, so it, it's really quite remarkable, in my opinion, that uh, it's only about 30% of the total number of Europeans that dropped out of the labor force were actually women. So, so the notion that you know, literally, sort of millions of women dropped out of the labor force to uh, to take care of household uh, chores, etc., is actually unsubstantiated by the um, by the data. Clearly, reflecting uh, the fact that women were, you know, remarkably able to take on this extra burden while still uh, uh, remaining employed. Now. I think that is actually very good news because it means that the, the, the likelihood for having a significant gender and uneven longer term scarring uh, from this uh, uh, pandemic is actually relatively modest. If anything, the data would suggest that the prospects for all men to come back into the labor force is actually worse than uh, when it comes to women. Uh, so I think that that actually is, is in that sense, quite good news. Another, I would argue, pretty good uh, macro effect or sort of circumstances in this pandemic is that we have not seen uh, any material dramatic, again, at the European level, dramatic increase uh, in youth unemployment. It's certainly the case that youth unemployment remains very high uh, in many member states. But in the aggregate, it has not been young people that has been disproportionate affected. It is, however, the case that, and this is where the majority of the impact on female employment has happened, is uh, when it comes to part-time workers. Um, there, uh, because the vast majority or about 75 percent of part-time workers in, in Europe are women uh, just, uh, effect uh, of, of that but as I said in the aggregate uh, the worst longer term effects namely if you drop out of the labor force entirely that effect has actually been disproportionately borne uh, by I think we're just having a couple of connection issues there. Uh, in with, the United um, States, the situation is actually. Perhaps um, Dr. Kierkegaard is kind of coming in and out a little bit with his uh, with his remarks, but I think the point that he was making there is that where the loss of employment has been seen that, particularly that has been in part time workers and part time workers particularly. Uh, tend to be women. So I thought that might be an interesting point actually to come back to Mary Collins on, because I know something that you've been looking at is whether the new the new patterns of working in the pandemic, including you know working from home and things like that, have led to uh, the sort of patterns of life in which women have taken on a greater burden of domestic roles and has perhaps led to a reinforcement of uh, of, of traditional gender roles. Is that something that we have data on? And is it, is, is it, could it be seen as a positive that the pandemic has sort of sped up the adoption of things like remote working that might allow people to be more flexible and combine uh, home and working life and even expand employment pos uh, possibilities away from urban centers? Could that even be seen as a positive? What does the data tell us on that? Thank you very much. So I think, first of all, we need to be clear. Part-time work has always been um, the majority of women, even before the pandemic. So that's one thing that's sure. Secondly, I think the issue is that the standard worker is still very much defined as the male breadwinner model. So full-time, uninterrupted work over a 45 years period of life. And that's a problem because that has always been a problem for women. 
because many women don't fit into that category and therefore it has long life consequences on their lives in terms of social rights and particularly in terms of pensions. I heard that the pensions were mentioned earlier on by Maria, but it is, it's always been a problem, a real problem. I mean, just to say that the pension, the gender pension gap in Europe is 40%, 40%, which is absolutely huge. So what we would like to see this pandemic is actually really a paradigm change. It's an opportunity to really revise um, you know, the, the traditional standards and the traditional models in place. And what we would like to see moving forward is that both women and men can become equal earners and equal carers. So it's not just about, um, you know, making sure that women have the possibility to do teleworking or not to be able to, you know, travel or commute or whatever, but it's about ensuring that in the model is about our collective responsibility towards care and our, our collective um, sharing of care as well. And that, that becomes the norm. So that issues relating to the standard worker and the, you know, the contributions to social security systems and protection systems and pension systems are actually shared as well. It's going to be disruptive. It's going to actually put everything into the equation. And that's why we are calling for also a care deal because the care deal is about recognizing that care is very central to all of our lives, all of our lives um, at every stage of our lives. And the right to be to care and the right to be cared for needs to be absolutely part of the equation moving forward. So we need to look towards using this opportunity now to actually revise where we're at for the moment. So the data, you were talking, asking about data as well. Yes, we do have some reports from the European Institute for Gender Equality. They have just issued their report on gender equality and the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19, which they did for the Portuguese presidency. And in that report, they clearly show that the issue of uh, unemployment, particularly for young women, as I said, migrant women, for women with uh, lower educational attainment is very high. And that is a real problem for the future moving forward, because these are our future you know, generations as well. So these are the kind of issues that we need to look for. And obviously there are different sources of data coming from different places, but we, the, this, we need to talk to each other. Data needs to talk to each other. And it's not about comparing this or that, but it's about saying, okay, how can we use this to move forward and to really look at a paradigm shift? Because I think that's probably one of the issues we saw at the beginning of the pandemic last year, that there was a paradigm shift that was looming on the horizon, but we mustn't go back into, fall back into our kind of the norm of the past. This is an opportunity to actually revise and to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I think that's really interesting how the pandemic has asked questions about the way that the structure of our lives is is built and also you know although it has been this incredibly negative and destructive thing it's also shown how profoundly things can change and um, that you know actually profound change is possible and governments can also change policies quite dramatically um, when they come to it and the point that you were making about an excessive um, or particular impact on more vulnerable groups including migrant workers some is something that's come up here in the q a um, something mentioned by Hansa Mzivat, who's offering a perspective from France and says that uh, uh, they've observed a uh, worsening in terms of interpersonal relations from that point of view. But I'd love to ask this question, which came from Alexandria Shastanet, who says, have we seen an impact on women who are young professionals? Um, she asks, have young professional women and mothers been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and how can we prepare and lift young women to ensure that the next generation of EU women um, continues to be present in all sectors, um, uh, particularly in international politics and leadership. Perhaps that's something that uh, Dr. Demetrius might, might like to come in on. Is that something that your economic research has uh, thrown up any insights on? 
Yes, thank you very much, Naomi. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Jakob for bringing uh, the, the macro perspective because we've looked at the same numbers and I think it's important to reflect on the fact that uh, not everything went wrong. And, and, and actually, particularly if you compare how we weathered COVID-19 on employment and unemployment with, to the US, you will really see big differences, not only on the level of employment, uh, but also on the discrepancy between men and women. And I think that's, a, that's an important thing. We have the tools in Europe, we have a welfare state that, that does, does contribute to these incredible shocks, and it's important to reflect on them. Um, however, there, there are there are also bits that uh, you know you still have uh, that are you know disproportionate effects on on women, and exactly on the on the issue of young women. Um, uh, there, there, I think it's important to nuance uh, what the data is saying. We've looked at uh, the three different age categories, and the category between 15 and 24, we do see a difference between uh, um, on, on the effect of COVID-19 on employment between men and women of about two percentage points um, in, in terms of how the discrepancy between men and male employment and female employment. We don't see any other difference uh, in any other age group above 24 years of age or the, the age where you're likely to be more uh, to be a mother. That's not we don't see a difference between men and women. And actually, when it comes to older, uh, the older category above 55, we actually see that women favored better uh, than men in, uh, in this respect. Where I think the big discrepancy is that has affected women disproportionately is on educational levels. The low educated women have been affected disproportionately a lot more than the low educated men. There we do see a, a very big discrepancy of the order of magnitude of four percentage points, uh, which is economically significant. This is where we, uh, we saw the big difference. And in fact, the low educated on the whole have been affected most uh, uh, in this pandemic and where I think this is correlates, if you like, very much with the issue of inequality at large. We have seen an increase in inequality uh, at the global level, also in Europe, even at smaller levels, but inequality has gone up. So any policies that can address the issue of inequality mm -hmm. will really favor also uh, uh, the discrepancy between uh, the genders. I think this is an important point. Um, I wanted to make two more points, but I don't know if this is the right uh, the right uh, point. If you want to come back on energy and you and other things, uh, but uh, I, you know, I'm happy to stop here and come back to them. Well, I know there was something that Dr. Kierkegaard wanted to contribute, and um, but I'd be happy to come back to your points after that, Dr. Mises. Sure. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to leave my uh, camera off in the interest of internet uh, <laughs> resilience. No, I just wanted to highlight also what Maria just said, namely, uh, with regard to the question of the effect of, um, you know, the reality is on also highly educated women, uh, as you know, it's really one of the remarkable characteristics of, of this pandemic is how strong, in my opinion, the uh, if you like, almost benefits for many well-educated and in a relative sense for many well-educated people uh, that are able to work from home uh, uh, relative to a lower skill that are not. I mean, you will see it in, in employment numbers. Uh, the the uh, highly educated uh, employment has actually significantly increased uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and whereas the losses have been entirely borne by, by the less educated and simply from the fact that uh, you know women today are better educated than men, uh, you know roughly under the age of forty, uh, that should be generally uh, a benefit uh, uh, for women. In addition to the uh, potential, at least for some, increased flexibility uh, that might also be uh, uh, in in the in the interest of some. Uh, Alexandra Geza, did you have a point that you wanted to come in on there? Yes, I do. Um, I was just wondering when your question back to Jakob, if you have a geographical um, divide of this data, because I know the data from Italy very well, because Italy has very, very good gender disaggregated data, um, because the, the National Statistic Institute is led by, by a feminist, um, and that helps. And I know that, for example, in the first 10 months of the pandemic in Italy, uh, 400,000 people dropped out of the labor market and 312,000 of them were women, almost 80%. And in December of that year, 2020, that even worsened. So in Italy, um, which is one of the hardest hit countries in economic terms, um, there clearly was a harder impact on women than on men. And therefore I was a little bit surprised 
um, about that aggregated European data um, not showing not showing that, not reflecting that. So maybe just as a question. And then I would like to come in on the question on young women. I think the young women are disproportionately um, affected. Um, for example, even women with higher education, it was noted that in the spring 2020, uh, publications of female academics dropped by half while male academics kept publishing in the same time. And this is going to have a long-term impact on who gets tenure and who will be able to teach and influence the next generations. And I think the same thing, I don't have data on this, but just anecdotal evidence, um, the same thing is true for companies because um, the people who steer company through a crisis are those who work until 10, 10 at night. And this is what women, especially mothers, you know, in that age group between 30, 45, where you have perhaps small children, uh, usually couldn't do during the crisis. And even those young women with small children who kept their jobs working from home, who were the privileged group, you know, because they're higher educated and managed to keep their jobs, the workload on these women, of whom, many of whom I know personally, is immense. Because you know, working from home doesn't mean that at the same time you can take care of either small children or children in school who can't go to school. Like in many European countries, children have been out of school for a month and have been studying from home, which basically means that the parents did the teaching. And that in 80 to 90% of the cases, unfortunately, is that at least in my country, Germany, we have statistics on this and 90% of the work was done by mothers. Mothers who then at night had to do their own jobs so I think the strain on women in this, in this period is absolutely unacceptable. And this will reflect not only on their psychological and, and physical health, but also on their advancement in, in their jobs and their careers, absolutely. So I think the impact is huge. Not to mention the fact that, um, I know this for certain in Italy, but I think it's true for other countries as well, that younger women are more likely um, to have um, limited, um, how do you say that in English, limited jobs. So they are more likely to have their contracts, to see their contracts not being renewed. Actually, the impact is higher on young women than, than on older women who might have stable jobs. So those would be the sort of jobs where it's for perhaps six months or a year and not a permanently employed job. Yes, um, I think that that's something that certainly is the first to be disrupted in a recession of any kind. Um, we have um, a number of different questions coming in, and I know that uh, Dr. Dremitz has also had further points to make. Um, but but quickly, uh, Dr. Kierkegaard, did you have um, anything to add on that data as to why there would be such a big difference between the aggregate EU figure and the individual figures for, for example, Italy, as uh, as Ms. Geza raised? Um, I mean, I, I mean, in short, no. But I mean, I think it's it's important to recognize uh, whenever you talk about employment, especially female employment and Italy, Italy is, for lack of a better word, unfortunately, the sick woman of Europe when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, women's attachment to the labor market. Uh, there are no other uh, country in Europe that has the same magnitude of uh, disc gender discrepancy. And, and uh, also Italy has um, with the possibility of one or the other of a very small member states, but Italy has a very dramatically lower, uh, and this was true pre-pandemic as well, uh, female labor force participation and general attachment to the labor, uh, labor market. So from that perspective, I'm not surprised uh, by the numbers that <coughs> Ms. Geza presented because it would have been unfortunately entirely predictable that on this metric, Italy would do a lot worse uh, uh, than, as I said, if you look at the aggregate number, pretty much everybody else uh, uh, in the EU. Dr. Demertsis, did you have a further point to make? Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, perhaps reiterate the point that I made at the very beginning, that uh, when we talk about EU data, we don't have one story. There are many different stories here, and I think it's crucial to remember that when you want to design policy, that you don't look at just EU numbers, you look at country numbers, because the differences are really immense. Uh, and, and there, you know, just some caution to the, uh, to the question that Alexandra raised, which is, you know, why is there a discrepancy between EU averages in Italy or any other countries? Because the average isn't really any one country is just an artificial number and you really need to look at countries to understand what policies to implement on italy i just wanted to while i there's a lot of i have a lot of sympathy with what uh, jacob uh, raised um, on, on 
there are some good news and I, I wanted to come back to this uh, metric, which for me has always been a very fascinating metric on the financial fragility of households, single parent households uh, in uh, with dependents, with children, uh, which, you know, more than one in two households, single parent households, and we know basically these are women households, uh, are financially fragile in Europe. The best performing country in this respect is Italy. Um, so meaning the least financial, it's still quite high, but it is the least uh, the least uh, number of households, single parent households. So there are other things, uh, family circles that protect possibly cultural aspects. I mean, this is not the time to discuss this, but not all is not all is lost. I wanted to say, raise two things on on, on the end next generation EU fund and and and. Um, um, apropos of something that Alexandra said earlier on, um, I remind you that the new Next Generation EU Fund is a one-off tool. Uh, and, you know, we one should never uh, lose an opportunity to set things straight in terms of, you know, to the extent that there are imbalances, we should use the tool as much as possible. Uh, but I think in order to really make progress, we should take the measures and put them in our everyday uh, tools. The budgets, these are great news. What, what Alexandra said about the budgets and how that has got a gender balance dimension. I think that is really great news. Of the Next Generation EU Fund, we should not divert from the ambition of what this fund is to do, which is to provide the green transition, to provide for the digital transformation. What I think we should do is make sure that more women participate in these sectors, because that will be the steady state and that will be a win-win for everyone, uh, if I may use that. And finally, I wanted to say something on, on teleworking, because you know that's going to be the next challenge of the future. Uh, to the extent that we want new norms, Mary, to, and, you know, new steady states, new normals, um, you know, teleworking is here to stay, and, and women can't actually take more advantage of this. We've, we see that more women were teleworking than men prior to the post-COVID crisis, to the extent that teleworking perhaps becomes a sort of much more normal in the way that they operate, this can really benefit women. So let's use that opportunity uh, to try and find a new uh, operating method on the working environment that actually can help women. Just to bring in an observation that came in on the chat, um, Ina Baton said that um, she disagrees that it's a um, it's a, um, she disagrees that it's a good thing that women appear to be able to combine work with an increased burden of caring and homeschooling, she says, because the mental strain will have long term effects and it can't be glossed over so easily. That's uh, her observation. Um, there's also a question from Nadia Dagnas, which came in on the idea of next generation EU being used to chat tackle uh, gender inequalities. And her question is how, how could this be done? Alexandra Geyser, would you like to come in on that from a policy perspective? Uh, I can do that. I think Mary wanted to come in. So I think Mary will speak about the care sector. So I just take the other aspect, if that's okay for you. And I would like to pick up on what, what Maria de Mezzo said. Um, we need to increase the number, the share of women in the sectors that are being funded, which are the green and the digital sectors, which will grow anyway. And this will get more serious um, going forward because uh, I work on artificial intelligence as well. And we will see a lot of automation that will probably affect jobs in the middle segment, not only low skill jobs, but also um, in the middle segment where a lot of women work who still have a decent salary and therefore, I think we, what we are seeing is globally that we really need to increase um, the share of women in the digital sector, in the more technical sectors, because otherwise we will have this sort of dichotomy between the care sector on the one hand and the more technical sectors on the other hand, and not much in between. And this will end up with the care sector having, we know that salaries are very low, people are, are usually not paid particularly well, and we have a high share of women there where we have good salaries in the more technological sector. And what I'm hearing from economists working on this is, oh, we don't worry about women dropping out of the labor market or losing their jobs in the future because women will still be able to work with people and the, the jobs with people will all, always be there. Those are not the jobs that are disappearing. And I think that is extremely, extremely worrying because it, that means to, to sort of perpetuate this labor market with segregation that leads to um, the lion's share of responsibility for the gender pay gap. That is not the pay gap within industrial sectors or within sectors, um, but it's the pay gap between different sectors, between care work, work with people 
and work with technology, basically. And this is why I thought it was so important to use the next generation EU funds in order to increase the share of women, especially in the digital sector, because that's going to be the sector shaping really our life, so our economy or democracies in the future, but also in renewable energy and the green sectors. And I think that is a missed opportunity because this opportunity has not been taken up. And I leave the cure part to Mary. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I obviously, you know, agree with um, Alexandra. I just wanted to say two things. I think you know, one of the, what we have seen over the last year is that gender stereotypes, rigid gender stereotypes are back in force. And I think that what we have seen during the pandemic is that women have been taken for granted and we have to stop that because they are in sectors of the economy which are essential to the continuation of society, the care sector in particular, and it is in everybody's interest. So it's really important that we begin to value that work. And when you were talking about the, um, the pay gap, for example, Alexandra, yes, what we can see is we're very much in a gender segregated labor market in which uh, areas of the economy, particularly care, are undervalued, underpaid, poor working conditions. And that needs to change. This is the opportunity now to actually make a change and to ensure that both women and men have the right to become equal earners equal car carers throughout their lives. And that is so essential moving forward. And I think I, I think it was um, Dan that said that your male workforce had increased um, parental leave, uh, you know, fourfold. And yes, we also have to look, look at the care sector as a potential sector for men as well. And that it's not just on the shoulders of women. And also I'd like to say that the care sector is part of the green economy. It's a sustainable, economic model and it doesn't pollute you know so we have there are lots of arguments around that that we need to close that circle with the green economy caring for the planet but caring for each other as well we need to have a, a green deal within that so i just think that we need to be behind the figures that we were giving particularly around italy and that why are there less women in the labor market in Italy? Because there's a huge expectation that women are the ones that are going to take care of everybody. There's no public investment or very lack of public investment, a dependency on migrant women as well to actually pick up that care sector. This is the moment now for us to really look at what kind of a future do we want? What kind of an economic model do we want moving forward? And we have to ensure that care is part of that and women are part of the digital revolution, evolution, and the green economy as well. So it's about having a holistic approach as we move forward and really to avoid getting caught in a gender segregated, stereotypical model because all of the progress we've made over the last two decades have been rolled back. And I think that's what we need to get on track now and to use our um, tools like the Next Generation EU you know, because it will be the next generation as well that will be paying back as well in, in 30 years time. So we need to make sure that everybody has a chance to ensure that it works for all, that we're moving towards an economic model that's inclusive, green and caring for all. It's within all of our interests. And I think the pandemic has certainly made that extremely visible and has really put that priority on the table. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, I have an interesting question here for Dan, but just before I go to that, um, Dr. Kierkegaard, did you want to come in on how next generation could be EU could be used to tackle gender inequalities? Uh, yes, I, I guess I would just offer perhaps a word of caution there, because I think it's 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 uh, when you have you know multiple policy tools and multiple policy goals, uh, but if you have only one tool, which is next generation uh, EU. You know, you need to be a little careful, I think, with with overloading it, uh, quite frankly, with with too many uh, policy goals, because you already have an inherent sort of, you know, conflict within next generation EU, which goes between short term stimulus uh, in those countries that that gets the largest share of the fiscal transfers. And then the longer run uh, structural changes that, uh, you know, digital, et cetera, that you want to um, promote for Europe's economy in the long run. And I think, uh, uh, I guess I would just say that, you know, there are, there is a risk of overburdening this tool if you all, if you already 
uh, made it or if you add it to the to the list of long term goals that it should help achieve. Uh, and I, I just I guess I would just say that I think that there I absolutely share the belief that uh, it's very important for uh, women to uh, uh, you know have a higher share of women in the digital sector, etc. But uh, uh, in the short run, because I also believe that there is an important short term stimulus aspect of next generation EU, uh, you, you have to basically stimulate, you know, quite frankly, the construction sector that you have. Uh, and that, unfortunately, at this stage is one where, where, more, where more men work uh, than women. Um, and we have to use other tools to promote uh, the longer term goals of uh, gender inequality, as well as higher representation of women in digital sectors and others. It's interesting. Um, I think um, MEP Alexander Geza had made an interesting point in the chat, which is that these priorities can be married together. So, for example, you could have a concrete measure to increase the share of women in the digital sector uh, funded under Next Generation EU, for example, by funding existing product pro projects that prepare women uh, within 12 months to enter the tech sector, for example, or that require companies to benefit from public funds uh, to draw up plans on how to increase the share of female employees and managers. Just as an example, we have digital and green uh, policies being married together in this policy uh, package, and you could also bring in gender equality as well. Um, that brings to actually an interesting question which came up uh, for um, Dan Mobley, um, which came from a one attendee who asked, you know, when you have a uh, an organization that's reluctant uh, to perhaps change their policies in order to, um, in, uh, when they're trying to change their culture when it comes to, for example, inclusion, diversity, gender and male leadership teams, how do you convince them to see this as a priority if it's not one for them already? Do you have any insights on that, Dan? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's, it's a great question. I'm glad the questioner used the word culture. because um, I talked earlier about the kind of toolbox you can use to make progress in this space, talking about setting targets, transparency, reporting against them, financial incentives to achieve them. And there's a whole range of things you can do as a corporate or any organization to make progress on, on diversity and inclusion, including on gender, but the other elements of inclusion too. But there's a prior step, which is changing the culture of your organization. Your leadership of your organization has to commit to this agenda very publicly and has to show zero tolerance towards any suggestion that this agenda is a kind of watering down of standards or performance. And we see too much of this in the corporate world, but elsewhere that somehow there isn't a business benefit from becoming more diverse and inclusive. And that's simply wrong. You know, so whether it's the suggestion that your financial performance won't benefit or that you're somehow compromising the talent you employ and retain. And actually progress in this area, the, 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 the reverse is true. This makes us stronger as a business. The Azure is emerging stronger from this pandemic than we went into it. And one of the reasons why I've been able to retain and hire the best talent, because we have a truly inclusive uh, culture, although there's always more to do. So I think internally leadership sets the tone for that culture and has to stamp out any suggestion that this is a compromise or will somehow adversely affect the, the company in the medium term. And then the other area is if the company can't change itself, then outside forces will need to force it to change. And one of the things I'm really heartened about is the investor community has really woken up in recent years. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, I think companies were ahead of where most of their investors were. I think that's no longer necessarily true. The investors are demanding rapid progress in ESG. And what's interesting is they've woken up to the S in ESG. So sustainability has come to the fore. Good governance has been uh, uh, definitely um, under the spotlight in terms of representation. But now on the S, whether it's human rights, and we're seeing the companies that are getting themselves in a mess over their supply chains because they haven't screened for human rights. Um, but we're also now seeing investors threaten to vote against boards if they're not sufficiently diverse and if they're not pursuing the, the right policy. So the investor piece is becoming prominent. And the last piece is regulation, intelligence, smarter regulation can get us there faster. And it's obvious that people in Alexandra's position, if you turn around and say, look, you've got a short period of time to get to where you need to be voluntarily. And if you can't, we're gonna regulate you. Um, and that's the only thing that will really force the laggards to move at, at the right pace. But ultimately the companies that get this right will perform better financially and non-financially than other companies. It's a source of competitive advantage and we just need to paint that picture for everyone to see. Alexander Geyser, do you think that's something that could work, you know, the threat of regulation? 
Um, well, I totally agree with what Dan said. I think the problem is culture in companies and the, the companies shutting basically women out. You know, the message that is sent out to women is don't come and work in technology. Um, there was in, in 2018, I think, or no, 19, there was the Google walkout, for example, to speak about big tech giants because that, you know, Google employees all over the world uh, walked out. Uh, in a public demonstration protesting against the rampant sexism in the tech industry. And I, this is not, not true for every company, but generally there's a feeling that women shouldn't be there. And if you talk to women working in those companies, especially in tech companies, they confirm that, absolutely. So we can't have that conversation saying, oh, it's the fault of girls not studying STEM and so on. And we have to start with girls who are three years old. And then you have the issue of gender marketing that girls don't get even get a, get a toy anymore that has anything to do with building our technology because the stereotype marketing is, is, has become so bad. So I think companies have really to change their culture. We, I'm, I'm not against regulation on this. Um, I think quotas for women are extremely important. important. Um, I, I, I serve in a party that has a rigid 50% quota for women and it's extremely successful. It gets a lot easier. You don't have to fight against all this sort of implicit um, not being seen, not being heard, always to have to fight to very normal relations. And I think this is what we should have in companies as well. And we know that like the one women on the board doesn't make the difference. You need to have 40% in order to be able, be, be able to behave naturally, to be there as a woman, as a person, as an individual, and not as the one token women fighting for something or not fighting because it's easier to get promoted if you don't fight for other women. Um, so I'm, I'm totally in favor of regulation and of quotas, but that's um, usually there's no political will to have that, especially in, in, you know, among economists as well, because most economists are male, there are very few. The other sector that is as exclusively male like big tech is uh, finance and um, economics, actually. Linda Scott wrote a wonderful chapter in her book, The Double X Economy on Harvard Business Schools and how economics departments all over the world are quite sexist. That's I can only recommend everybody to read it. That's that's quite telling. So I'm in favor of regulation, but I think it's especially important if we're talking like we're talking next generation EU about public funding of private companies, because this is what we are speaking about. We're speaking about money paid to be paid in the future by taxpayers, by new taxes. And taxpayers are women and men. Even if women make less money, they still pay a lot of taxes. And so it's men and women equally financing this package. And therefore I think there should be strings attached for companies, not only to spend this money on men. I think this is absolutely obvious. And this, this is why I think that companies who uh, can spend this money, who can invest this money should be investing it in men and women. And I think we should have had regulation on this. And I'm very sorry we don't. Thanks very much, Alexandra. We have an interesting question that's come in there from Selma Harrington, which is kind of on a related point about different sectors. So she says, thanks very much for the insightful presentations. And it seems that there's a lack of representation by engineering and creative professions, including architects, designers, and cultural workers in the recovery narrative. And she asks, can the panel comment on the inclusion of these, including women, particularly in the light of the new European Bauhaus initiative and aspirations to place culture as a driver as, of sustainable recovery? And can it be included in the in brief developments prior to deciding on uh, policy measures, mechanisms, instruments and implementation? Um, which of our panelists would like to come in on this? Perhaps Dan, you'd like to offer a perspective there. Yeah, yeah, quickly and, and also it refers to some of Alexandra's points, which I, I do agree with. On the subject of kind of STEM or more broadly, a sort of shortage of supply of women for certain roles. I mean, this is so clearly nonsense. Yeah, and it's so obvious that first of all, if you create demand, you will get the supply. Um, if you're providing well remunerated work in these areas, you will find talented women to, 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 to fill it. And if you want to accelerate that, there's lots that corporates can do. So on STEM, we offer scholarships and we do partnerships with universities applying a gender lens where, where appropriate to try and increase the supply of everything from liquid technologists and other innovation scientists through to specialist engineers 
you know, um, encouraging the creation of PhD doctorates in um, barrel technology because we've got billions of pounds of Scotch whiskey maturing on a hillside and some of it evaporates, you know. So if you put a gender lens on that, you can quite quick, quickly create the supply you need to ensure that, that then you're, uh, you're, you're hiring and developing the best possible talent. Um, and then within that, more broadly, your point, Alexandra, around um, uh, you know, certain sectors, tech being an obvious one. But I think large corporates across sectors, we're all interconnected. Um, you know, these are major suppliers to us. Uh, and actually, I think companies also have a responsibility and, and again, a business imperative to demand from their suppliers that they meet certain standards. And, and that's becoming commonplace in sustainability. So we have a net zero target on carbon to 2030. But, you know, most of our carbon emissions are in our supply chain. So we're setting targets for our suppliers and we ourselves are in the supply chains of retailers uh, and others. You need that kind of thinking also to apply to diversity. So I've mentioned, you know, when we're working with marketing agencies, if they don't meet standards of diversity, we won't work with them and we work with them to train them and their people to make sure they're progressive in marketing. But it's also true of the big tech sector, too. I mean, we participated with the boycott of big tech platforms over hate speech um, most recently, and a large number of companies participated in that to try and force change. Uh, and so those that, la you know, continue to just use the excuse of we can't find talent. Uh, that's clearly not true, and, uh, and we've got to put pressure upon them. And on the point, may I very briefly? Yes, please. I mean, on this. Now, since Dan mentioned it, I just wanted to make it more explicit. I mean, gender procurement is is a very powerful tool as well because we are now seeing on the next generation EU many projects assigned to large, um, very large public or private companies in certain member states, they could still use gender procurement in order uh, to make sure that further down the line, women women are still included and have an opportunity just to you know, drop that buzzword. Mar Marcella Corsi suggests that it's important to monitor the gender impact of Next Generation EU by applying gender budgeting in all of its missions, which sounds like something that uh, is, is done in Italy in terms of economic data from our discussion here. And uh, another audience um, member suggests that um, there's also an issue in terms of representation in construction, particularly in jobs that don't need university level education. Um, and that's the, even more severe than in digital jobs. Uh, well, Nadia Dagna suggests that the exuberant housing sector, which I'm not personally familiar with, um, is a, a, a struggle for single uh, parents who are women in Europe. Um, it uh, is, it, uh, could I, I might open the question up to the broader panel in terms of which sectors are being included in the recovery. Obviously, we have uh, green and digital um, priorities, but um, going back to the question on engineering and the creative sectors, is that something that's been, is the, I suppose, is the, the potential of those sectors adequately uh, a trip, uh, accounted for? Um, perhaps, um, Mary, would, would that be like something you'd like to comment on? Okay, thank you very much. So just first of all, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that were said. So you're talking about regulation, first of all, and I think, you know, that a lot of employers are very kind of frightened of um, quotas having regulation in place. But we mustn't forget it's a means to an end and not an end in itself. So it's about really stimulating and about bringing about change. So I think it's really important that we have, um, you know, a forced mechanism, so to say, um, but there are many, you know, good practices out there, and it really would be important as well that those sectors of the economy would add to the best practices and really to reassure that this is actually in everybody's interest. So I think that that's one thing I wanted to say. And um, then in relation to the public procurement, I think, I'm, yeah, absolutely, I think it's extremely important that public procurement, because it is public money at the end of the day, being invested in private companies, but that it's really important that there is a very strong gender dimension. And we're looking at things not only, you know, about the representation of women in the sectors, but also the pay gap, because they, this is one area as well, where public procurement can actually play a very important role. In terms of the recovery, because the two issues were um, targeted as in green, so moving from a green, moving to a green economy, and to a digital world, obviously they are the most important that have been in the um, in the recovery facility. Um, but we need to be a little bit more creative 
Um, as I say, you know, the green economy includes the care economy. We need to really look at things not strictly from the kind of a stereotypical way of looking at things, but actually to ensure as well that within that, um, that structure, that there are things like targets, objectives, um, goals, um, you know, also in terms of quotas, you know, this needs to be a shakeup now. We really need to ensure that it's, you know, that it is actually looked at from a very different perspective from the way things were looked at in the past. And then finally, I just wanted to say that um, it really is important that uh, women in decision making, you know, because this is going to make a huge, huge difference along the way as well. And just to point out that there is on the table a women on boards directive proposal for a directive uh, in terms of increasing the number of women in, um, in the boards in, of companies, of the major companies in Europe. That has been on the table for the last seven, eight years since 2012. And it's about time now that this moves as well, because it might just be focusing on a particular sector, but it's going to give a very positive signal to other sectors as well. So just to say that there are things there, that, but we need to actually shake them up and push them so that this can become, the recovery plan be, can become really a meaningful, transformative model for us moving forward for the next decade. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, two questions came in for uh, Jakob, one from Hannah, which was about the statistics that were mentioned about people who fell out of the labour market entirely. Um, she asked, does that include people on who, who are on furlough or job support, support schemes? And if that is the case, does that mean then that the government job support, support schemes disproportionately supported men? And Lena asked if... Um, why is it that gender mainstreaming is seen as overloading objectives is it if it's supposed to be part of business as usual for the EU? Dr. Kierkegaard, did you hear those questions okay? He might have an issue with his connection, um, in which case we can return back to the rest of the panel. Um, I'd be interested to know, uh, perhaps from Dr. Uh, Demirtsis, um, do you think, do we have any indication about what kind of permanent changes there could be to the labour market and to, to working patterns that could affect women? I know this is it's difficult to kind of tell the future, of course, but at this point, is there any indication of permanent change from uh, COVID-19 or, or are we going to see things gradually kind of returning to a norm? Well, uh, as Mary said, I hope this is a wake up call in, in, in this respect. So, you know, maybe this is a hope more than a forecast, but uh, I think there is there is there are in, intrinsic structural changes, forces at least, that may lead to permanent change and they're worth exploring. Um, the, the, what I see for at least for my sector, and I'll come back a little bit and comment a little bit on, on this as well, um, is the, the first one is teleworking. I think this is one that uh, is uh, will, will in some fashion uh, remain uh, after the after we go back to after we after we bring out the economies from the comatose state we put them in, um, and and it, at some point this will happen. Um, and I think the, 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 I mean I see here in, in Brussels where I live where there is already a permanent change that f companies have uh, instigated. Yeah, at Bruegel we are thinking about how to make um uh, teleworking as part of a normal uh, working uh, uh, environment so i think that that is one permanent change and you know as, as somebody from your comments actually doubted the fact that this will not affect the women uh, uh, negatively and and you know i think the the jury is still out there i think um, it's really up to us designing teleworking to make sure that it doesn't affect women disproportionately. Uh, and to the extent that flexibility is something that, uh, that we like and women like flexibility because of all the other caring activities that they have, this could be really uh, good for, uh, for women, but there are issues and th there is evidence that goes in the other way. That's important in the designing of incentives for people to telework and come, around, uh, and come into the office uh, space. I think it's important uh, to, to, get, to get the details right in order to make sure that it doesn't affect women, but takes advantage of the flexibility that it offers. 
Um, I wanted to perhaps make my comment on the supply issue, and both Tan and, uh, and others have, have raised this issue. From where I stand, and I come, as Alexandra said, I, I come from a sector, the economic sector, economics and finance is a sector where women are very clearly underrepresented, uh, vastly underrepresented, and they're uh, vastly underrepresented at all levels, including uh, students coming to university, which is, we really see, they used to be just below two men for every woman coming to economics, now it's closer to three three women three men for every woman that come into the economics degrees and i'm talking about uh, uh world numbers again there isn't one story there are differences between between countries but 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 it's not good it's, it doesn't look good in this of the the supply that the, the pool of people that we are gathering and training as economists that we can later use to put in leadership positions and that's that's i mean you know these are the numbers um and and you know we we can do something about it but before we can do something about it we have to understand why why is it that women don't opt to study economics let alone do phds or let alone go into big banks or into big sectors or you know um and, and you know that's not quite so easy understanding understanding what is the cultural Pref element that is keeping women away from economics. And personally, I believe there is something about Econ 101 that we need to fix to try and attract women. I mean, you know, the idea of profit maximization, averages, women like about, think about distributions before men. Uh, and, and that's something that we should put in our Econ 101 class, not just about averages, but bringing everybody along in sort of doing better. I think this is something that it's a paradigm, as Mary said, paradigm shift. Well, that's one of the things that could help us before we can go into anything else. Uh, like Alexandra, I'm also a very big fan of quotas because we are talking about a gender imbalance. If it's an imbalance, we need to correct for it. And to correct for it, you need to veer on the other side to be able to come closer to averages that are more representative. Um, again, I think Mary said that this is a, is, a, is a means to an end. And indeed, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. We are correcting an imbalance. And I think if you start from that thinking, correcting imbalances mean veering off to one side to be able to get, get it closer to where you want it to be. So I think that's an important thing. But let's not, 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 not pretend that there isn't a supply side issue. There is, at least in economics, we face it. I mean, I can quote some numbers at Bruegel. We cannot find women economists to come in. Uh, to have a 25% representation amongst our research staff, the research staff, the content staff, we have a 64 representation in the non-research staff when it comes to women. So quite clearly we have a huge supply issue, but we need to sort this out and we cannot afford not to use any tools that we have at hand. And let's do that. Thank you very much. And I might bring in uh, Dan quickly. We just have a couple of minutes left, but there was a question which came in, which is that it, can the EU learn anything from the corporate sector in terms of implementing policies? Um, I mean, there's about to be billions deployed in the recovery fund. And how could this actually be used to make a difference for gender equality? Yeah, it's another very good question. I, I won't repeat everything I've said. Um, I think the basic points around starting from the top so leadership is absolutely pivotal, pivotal in this, and it's good to see the new commission, uh, you know, making progress on representation. It's good to hear people starting to talk about gender-based budgeting, screening, transparency, and so on. But that kind of cultural step of this, this is not just the right thing to do, but this will help us achieve our goals quicker and more effectively. And that, in this case, includes rapid recovery from, uh, from COVID. So I would say that cultural point would be one. And then this point around radical transparency so set clear ambitions um, report very clearly against them and incentivize people to meet them uh, and you know it's a while since i've been in in brussels or indeed directly in politics but understanding the incentives that people are under are they matching up against the, the ambition that the leadership is setting out so those are the two areas i would say if we really want to walk the talk here change the culture of these organizations and be absolutely clear that you're aligning your um your your incentives with your ambition Thanks so much. Um, we're just nearly at time now. We've got just three minutes left. So I'm just going to quickly open it to our panel in case anyone had a few concluding remarks they'd, they'd have to make in, in just a couple of sentences or less. Uh, feel free to come in if there's something you'd like to add as a final point. Yeah, maybe I can just come in and say, well, again, thank you very much for this. I think what really has, you know, we need to talk and we need to dialogue and we need to really look at what are the issues at hand and how can we move forward? How can we really galvanize our strengths together 
to actually move forward. And I think there are some things on the table now. There's the Next Generation EU, the Recovery and Resilience Facility. I think that's a focus that we need to actually um, give immediately so that we can ensure that we're going to get on a track that will bring us all to a, you know, a more equal, inclusive, greener society for the benefit of everybody. I think that has been very clear in the pandemic. This is what we want and this is what we need and we all depend on each other. So I very much look forward to continuing that conversation with you all in different spaces and different places. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I think that concludes things really neatly for us. So I'd just like to say a huge thanks to all of our uh, panelists for giving us their time and their really interesting insights. Thanks very much to Mary Collins, Dr. Maria uh, Demertzis, uh, MEP Alexander Geza, Dan Mobley, and Dr. Jake Jakob Kierkegaard. Thank you so much for all of those insights and for what I think was a really interesting discussion on a topic that's of huge importance, importance at the moment and is obviously a pressing policy issue now that such an unprecedented amount of money is about to be spent on a ambitious transformation of the EU economy um, and uh, really interesting questions being raised about whether or not uh, gender parity has been adequately included in that. So huge thanks um, to everyone there. And thanks again to our audience for following us along and for your great questions in this discussion. Thank you.